So everyone, thanks for stopping by for another outstanding talk at Google. It's great to see so many attention respectful Googlers here in the audience. Uh, we're taking a look today at something that's quite relevant to the, the daily life that we lead, um, technology and organization. You know, after all, we are here to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, so they say. Um, today we're, we're pleased to host Dr. Daniel Levitin. He's stopping by to assist us in this journey. Um, he's the best-selling author of The World in Six Songs, and this is your brain on music. And today he speaks to us about the organized mind, thinking straight in the age of information overload. Um, taking views from neuroscience and from history, he takes the latest research in cognitive psychology and brings it to the masses in a, a book that's really, really quite interesting. So if you'll please join me in welcoming him to Google, we'll get started with the talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me back at Google. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and um, everyone's been so nice since I got here. A few engineers came up to me and said it was so nice to be able to put a face with all that click traffic they've been watching all these years. Um, uh, I want to talk about three big ideas, and then I'd be happy to take some questions. The three big ideas are uh, multitasking, uh, brain extenders, and decision-making in the age of information overload. But first, uh, I'll give you a little glimpse into why I, I wrote the book. Um, neuroscientists in the last 10 years have learned quite a bit about why the brain pays attention to some things and forgets others. And most of that information hasn't trickled down to the average person. And I think that all of us can use this information in our daily lives to better organize our time, uh, our homes and workplaces. And I wrote the book as a way to, to share what it was that we as a field had learned and to give some practical tips about how to use that information. So the three big ideas. Uh, first, some numbers. Just to quantify what it is we mean by information overload. Americans, as, as you know better than anyone else, take in five times more information today than they did in 1986. That's the equivalent of 174 newspapers worth of information. During our leisure time alone, we process 34 gigabytes of information. And we've created a world that has 300 exabytes of human-made information. Just one person's share of that, your share of the 300 exabytes, if each piece of information pertaining to you was written on a three by five index card and laid out end to end, side by side, it would cover all of the square miles of Massachusetts and Connecticut combined in an, over, an overwhelming amount of information. And so no wonder most of us are feeling like we can't keep up. And if you like watching YouTube uh, as for work or for relaxation, and you feel like you want to keep up with what's happening and what's new there, as, as you probably know, every hour, YouTube uploads 6,000 hours of new video. So that means for every hour of YouTube video you watch, you're falling 5,999 hours behind. The only way you could possibly keep up is if you had 6,000 screens going all at once. And I'm sure uh, at some point in the near future that number is going to double and keep on doubling. So enormous amount of information. What can we do about it? Well, what many of us do about it is we multitask. We do a whole bunch of things at once, figuring that uh, that way we can manage all of the stuff that's coming at us from all different sides. Uh, but it turns out that multitasking is a myth. Uh, and there's now ample research that justifies and supports this. I know that it's part of Google culture to have transmitted this information uh, to all of you. Um, multitasking does not exist. What's actually happening in the brain is sequential tasking. The brain is rapidly shifting from one thing to the next. It's doing so so quickly and seamlessly that you don't really notice, but that's what's happening. And what you end up with is attention that's been fractionated into little three to five second bits, and you're not able to actually sustain attention on any one thing. Uh, multitasking can release the stress hormone cortisol which might make you feel at the end of a couple hours like your head has been in a salad spinner. Uh, multitasking is also 
responsible for that mental fog you feel, partly due to the, the release of cortisol. So you're not saving time, you're wasting time. There are actually very few jobs that require multitasking. Uh, one of them is an air, is air traffic controller. Uh, another is simultaneous translator at the UN. And those jobs have high costs if, if the worker makes a mistake, right? I mean, it's obvious if you make a mistake as an air traffic controller, the consequences can be calamity, disastrous. Same for simultaneous translators at the UN. You get one word wrong, you may have a war on your hands, right? So these jobs, it's no coincidence that they have mandated breaks. People in those high stress jobs, air traffic controllers, for example, they're not allowed to work more than 45 or 60 minutes without taking a 15 to 30 minute break. That's their duty cycle. Uh, a couple of other jobs that require multitasking come to mind. One is kindergarten teacher, uh, and the other is publicist or social network consultant, and another is journalist, you know, news, breaking news journalist. But apart, apart from that, it's not really a job requirement for most of us, and it ends up at the end of the day, based on a number of productivity studies, the people who were multitasking were getting less done by any measure than the people who were unitasking. Now, why does it feel like we're multitasking? Well, it's an illusion. And the, you know, as a neuroscientist, I can tell you the brain is very good at self-delusion. That's one thing that it's really good at. Uh, and we see it in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, I, I, for one, know that I look a lot better after I've been drinking. Uh, <laughs> but people tell me that that's self-delusion. I'm also a lot more clever, and I'm a better fighter after I've had a few drinks, or, or so I think. Uh, so the brain doesn't always have insights into what it's good at and what it's not good at. We're deceiving ourselves when we think we're multitasking. We really aren't. The productivity studies bear this out. So what can you do about it? Well, we could take a tip from the air traffic controllers and the simultaneous translators, and we could take breaks. Uh, and workers who are allowed to do this in a number of studies and a number of industries uh, end up being more productive and creating better quality work. So you have to decide what the appropriate breaks are depending on the kind of work you do and depending on how your brain works. But a, a good rule of thumb is uh, every couple hours take 15 minutes off. Uh, naps are also very helpful. Uh, short naps. Uh, even 10 or 15 minute nap in the middle of the day can be the equivalent of an hour and a half of extra sleep the night before and it can raise your effective IQ by 10 points. So naps are a good thing. And I, I read somewhere that Google has nap rooms, at least in some of the facilities. Is this true? So uh, this is already a part of your culture, but I'm, I'm saying it because this is being taped and this will go out beyond Google, I guess. But uh, other companies have been promoting this too. Safeway stores, uh, the big grocery chain in the East Bay, has nap rooms and exercise rooms. These are all critical uh, because of the underlying neurophysiology. The nap helps to restore your depleted uh, sources of glucose in the brain, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. And the breaks allow you to enter a different attentional mode. And I want to talk about that for a minute, about what the vacations uh, that you take uh, are doing for you neurophysiologically and what the breaks and the naps are doing. So there are two dominant modes of attention in the human brain. One is goes by the rather inelegant name of the task positive network. More colloquially, colloquially this is the, uh, the central executive of the brain. It's the part of your brain that is engaged in a task and you're not distracted. So you might be writing a report or doing research or reading a book, engaging in a conversation, but if you're focused and you're not distracted, you're in that mode. The second dominant mode of the brain is called the task negative network and it's when you're not doing a task and your mind is wandering. And this is a part of the brain, a network of brain regions that has been called the default mode of the brain because it exerts a pull on that other part of your brain and it's a kind of natural state that the brain wants to go to. So I'm sure you've all had this experience that you're reading a book uh, and at some point your eyes get ahead of where you are in the book. And you realize, well, your eyes have been following the words, but your brain hasn't. And you've got to go back a ways and, and figure out, well, that's the mind-wandering mode that has kicked in. It's not that your brain had shut off. You were just thinking other thoughts. 
may be stimulated by what you had read. And so this mind-wandering mode turns out to be very different from the task engagement mode because it's where thoughts that are loosely connected seamlessly flow into one another, like in a dream. That's why we call it daydreaming. And you begin to see connections between things that you didn't see as connected before. Uh, it's loosely affiliated thoughts uh, flow into one another. Um, Nonlinear kinds of thinking, uh, sometimes juxtapositions of different ideas. This is um, the mode of thinking where your most creative acts are likely to occur and where problem solving is uh, apt to occur. So I'm sure you've had this experience that you're trying to solve some problem, work something out, you focus on it, you're getting nowhere, you, you drop it for a while, you might be out shopping, and suddenly it hits you, the answer. That's the daydreaming mode having kicked in. It usually kicks in when you're doing something else that doesn't require a lot of focus, and so the daydreaming mode takes over. And if you use a little bit of self-reflection and think back, or the next time it happens, analyze what's going on, it's probably that the solution was something that wasn't obvious before, or you would have thought of it. It's something that required a kind of nonlinear thinking or putting together, piecing together of disparate ideas that you hadn't seen as connected before. So problem solving depends on this other mode of the brain. And it's essential for all of us who are engaged in creative pursuits uh, to be able to go back and forth between the two modes. Now, attention switching, such as we do during multitasking, and decision making deplete fuel in the brain. Specifically, they deplete glucose. So glucose is the fuel that neurons need. Gl neurons are living cells with a metab metabolism, and they need glucose in order to function. Uh, and glucose is not in an unlimited supply. Every decision that you make depletes a little glucose. Every time you switch tasks, it, tasks, it depletes a little bit. And it turns out that even small decisions deplete your stores of glucose as much as big ones do. So if you're trying to decide which breakfast cereal to buy at the store, uh, or whether to use a bread pen or a blue pen for something, these seemingly inconsequential decisions are still decisions as far as your neurons are concerned. And they're competing with mental, for mental energy with important decisions, like whether to uh, put your pension into stocks or bonds, or how to resolve some interpersonal problem you have. Uh, they're competing with trying to remember things like uh, you have to pay your electric bill uh, uh, on a certain day at a certain time. Whatever the decision is, um, it's depleting these neural resources. Kicking into the daydreaming mode is one of the best ways that we know of basically hitting the reset button in the brain and allowing the glucose to build up again. Taking a nap is another good way, as is taking a vacation. Vacations are very important, it turns out. And when I'm talking about taking breaks and vacations, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm going to stop working, I'm going to do email or I'm going to uh, watch television. Those are not breaks. I mean, a real break, the, the most restorative kinds of breaks are things where your mind can really wander. And each of us has a different way that we can kickstart that process. It might be exercise. Uh, it might be walking in, in nature or a walk around the block. Turns out there are evolutionary reasons why exposing yourself to nature enables you to hit the reset button. Being around natural things like trees, uh, water, uh, bodies of water, mountains, uh, flowers and shrubs. That's a very restorative environment. Uh, I used to work in the laboratory of Amos Tversky here at Stanford, uh, who did a lot of work on decision making. And every afternoon, he and Danny Kahneman, his colleague, would take a walk around the Stanford campus. And as Danny reports in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, most of their greatest ideas came from those walks. And that's, that's no coincidence. Uh, this is a restorative, creative act. So exercise, taking walks, taking a nap, literature, reading. Uh, reading uh, stimulates this, this mind-wandering mode uh, and helps you to, uh, to hit the reset button. The pull that we feel against all of this, this very natural uh, thing that we feel, is that there's so much going on and we're asked to do so much more now than ever before that we feel as though if we stop our work for just five minutes, we're going to fall behind. You know, you already have 300 unread emails in your inbox, so how can you take five minutes off? But the productivities are very clear on this. If you take off those five minutes, at the end of the day, you get back more than that. 
And overtime is even worse. In a number of studies, people who work 60-hour weeks don't get an extra 20 over their 40-hour-a-week counterparts. They end up getting only seven hours of extra work done. So you're putting in three hours to get one hour of work done, according to uh, the research. Uh, not in every profession, not in every case. This is on average. But, and you can certainly think of counterexamples. If there's a crisis, I mean, look at the, the Ebola workers in, in Liberia, or you know, if there's an earthquake and rescue workers, you know, they, of course, it's worth, it's worth getting those seven hours is worth them putting in 20. But in daily life, in your daily work, if it's not an emergency situation, it's worth looking at. Am I willing to put in 20 to get seven? It may not be the best use of your time or the company's time. So what can we do about this? How can we create this kind of focus that I'm talking about? Uh, one thing that experts do is they enforce productivity hours. Uh, they'll set aside a certain time of day or several times during the day when they don't want to be interrupted. And they turn off their email program. Uh, they, they might even turn off their phone. And, and they allow themselves to enter a, a state of undistracted, sustained concentration. And I think you'll agree that most of the things that we care about, whether at work or at home, whether it's time with family or time on a, a, a much-loved hobby, uh, they're more enjoyable when you're fully immersed in them, not when you're trying to do five things at once. So these productivity hours are very important. And people always say, well, I can't turn off my email. Uh, something urgent might come in. Well, the answer to that is you just open up another account, uh, at a private account, and you give that address only to those people who need to reach you urgently. So a number of successful uh, and productive people do this. They might give the address only to eight or 10 people, maybe a boss, somebody who works for them, a couple of coworkers, immediate family members. And you can instruct those people, only use this address if it's urgent. If you're sending me a video of a cat playing the piano, or an invitation to a party that's a month away, use my, my regular address, because that account's going to be turned off most of the day. This is the one where I can be reached urgently. This kind of partitioning is what highly successful people do. Uh, I interviewed a number of, of uh, CEOs and successful artists, musicians, Nobel Prize winners, scientists, uh, military leaders, and government leaders for the book. And one of the things that was a, a, a thread through all of this uh, in trying to understand their productivity is they really partition things like that. And I think, I, fi I find the idea refreshing because if you're like me, uh, for a lot of your working adult life, when you've been at home, you've probably been thinking about work. And when you're at work, you're probably thinking about home and you find that you're not really in either place fully. And that's no way to live. It's better to be fully in one activity or the other. So those are some of the tips for avoiding distraction. Now I talked about uh, and I'll come back to this in a minute. I want to um, shift and talk about brain extenders. Uh, this is a very simple idea. The idea is that if you want to be more productive and creative, don't load up your brain with stuff that doesn't need to be there, right? So uh, a great example is you hear on the weather report that it's going to rain tomorrow. Why stick in your head, oh, I've got to remember to bring an umbrella, which is going to take up neural resources? Put that information in the environment. Go to the closet, get your umbrella, put it by the door, and then it will remind you to take it when it's time. Uh, if you're the kind of person that loses your keys, get a key hook and put it by the front door or a decorative bowl on a console table by the front door. If the keys always go there, you don't have to think about where they are. Another example of brain extenders are doors in, in office buildings. Uh, why should you have to remember how every individual door in your life opens and closes? Uh, and in, in big buildings, usually this information is offloaded to the environment. If the door has a big horizontal bar across it, you know you have to push it and the door is going to open out. And if it has a kind of U-shaped handle on it, you know you're supposed to pull it and that the door is going to open in. You don't have to remember this or keep track of it. The psychologist J.J. Gibson called these affordances. They afford uh, the way in which they're supposed to be used. You uh, HCI people know this term, I'm sure. Uh, and we can do that in all different ways in our environment to uh, externalize. The other thing that we do to externalize is we write things down. Uh, as soon as you put something on paper, your brain no longer needs to keep track of it. And paper is actually better for remembering things and putting it than typing it. it. Because of the neural circuitry involved in writing something longhand, you end up processing the information more deeply. So writing it down uh, in many cases is better than typing it down. 
Now, Google has, of course, been the de facto information source uh, for the last uh, number of years, replacing long trips to the library, combing through irrelevant pages in dusty books to find the one fact that you were looking for. Uh, as my colleague Christopher Chabri says, we've outsourced to Google a massive volume of research chores that used to take anywhere from minutes to months of trawling through reference sources, making phone calls, and visiting archives. Our searches are in order of magnitude more efficient and less time consuming than 20 years ago. And this is an example of externalization. We no longer need to carry around facts like in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, or the sun is 93 million miles away, or what the time difference is between here and Mumbai. We can get it in you know, a half a second on an object we hold in our hands that has more processing power than Apollo mission control had. So this is a great example of a brain extender. And I think that um, it's a very important way that we can become more productive and efficient. Don't keep up here things that don't need to be up here. And you understand this, I think, better than anyone. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, is decision making. Um, with all of this information at our fingertips, um, we have the power to make decisions that we couldn't make before. And a good example of that is in the medical domain. It used to be that you just went to the doctor and you did whatever the doctor told you. But now there's all kinds of information available through the internet uh, that can help you to make an informed choice. Uh, there's so much more information now than before. By some estimates, the amount of scientific information in the world uh, in the last 20 years equals all of the scientific information generated up to that point in history. So we've doubled scientific information in 20 years by some estimates, and there's enormous amounts of medical data. Uh, it turns out that for some of the most difficult decisions we make in medicine, whether to get a treatment or not, uh, whether to take a drug or not take it, uh, whether to have surgery or radiation uh, treatment if you've got cancer, these different kinds of decisions, doctors aren't schooled uh, in a lot of the decision-making processes that need to be applied here. It's not part of their curriculum. Uh, they don't always know how to acquire the information, and once they do, they don't know how to analyze it. And I think we're at an age where uh, it's becoming increasingly apparent that we all need to take control of our own medical decision-making, and we need to become proactive and responsible. Um, and the information age has allowed that. Of course, the difficult thing is separating the digital wheat from the digital chaff, trying to figure out what is good information and what is not. So one of the things I think we need to do is start teaching our children right away information literacy. I think the primary mission of education has to shift. It used to be trying to teach children a bunch of facts. Now they can get the facts. I think what we have to do is start teaching them how to use those facts to use them intelligently and creatively in order to help solve the world's problems. So to go back to the medical case, um, if you're looking up a, a particular prescription drug and trying to figure out you know, whether you want to take it or not, the first thing that's part of information literacy that every eight-year-old should know is, whose website are you on? Is it the drug manufacturers? Might there be biased information there? Is it the site for the manufacturer of a competing drug? Maybe it's some sort of shadow site for the manufacturer of a competing drug, uh, you know, under the name uh, AmericansForBetterHealthCare.com or something like that, and it's really a shill for another drug company. Uh, these are questions that are important to ask so that you can be informed. And why is it that these uh, I'm making such a big deal out of medical decisions? Well, I walk through several examples in the book. I'll give you one. Um, suppose you go to your doctor, and your doctor says that your cholesterol is high and that she wants to start you on statins. You've heard of statins. Uh, you know that they're cholesterol-lowering drugs. And so you think, sure, why not? Sounds like a good I I'd like to have lower cholesterol. Well, the first question you should ask is, what is the number needed to treat? Now, this is a little-known statistic that doctors don't like talking about and pharmaceutical companies like even less. It's the number of patients that have to take a drug for it to be effective on one patient. 
Now, you're probably thinking, well, that's crazy. The number should be one. I mean, why would my doctor be giving me a medication that's not going to help me? But it doesn't actually work out that way because there are a lot of medications that don't work on everybody. In fact, most uh, don't work on everybody. I, I can only think of one or two medications where the number needed to treat is one. And they're for rare cancers where that only a few hundred people a year get. For most of us, the drugs aren't going to work on everybody. So think about this for a minute. What do you suppose the number needed to treat for the, one of the more popular statins is? How many people need to take it before one person gets cured? For the one I'm thinking about, and which uh, Penguin's lawyer said I'm not allowed to say out loud, <laughs> for the one I'm thinking of, the number needed to treat is 300. And I didn't just pull this out to shock you. This is a typical number needed to treat for pharmaceutical products. 300 people take the drug, one person gets better. So now you're thinking, well, OK, I, I don't want to have high cholesterol. And sure, I, I'm willing to take the chance of being the one in 300 that'll help uh, because I'm, I'm helping to reduce the chance of my getting a heart attack. Uh, but then the next question you should ask your doctor is, well, wait a minute. What are the chances of side effects for this drug, and what are they? Well, for the drug I'm thinking about, one of the most popular cholesterol-lowering drugs, uh, the side effects occur in about 5% of the people who take it. And the side effects uh, include severe muscle and debilitating muscle and joint pain, gastrointestinal distress, diarrhea, blood in the stool, blood in the urine, headaches, nausea, and dizziness. These are awful. 5% of the people are getting it. Well, that's not a lot. But if we take, you know, five out of 100, but if we take the 300 that we're talking about, that means 15 people are going to have the side effects for every one person who's helped. You're 15 times more likely to experience the side effect than the cure. So now the calculation becomes a little different about whether you want to take this thing or not. This is the kind of information literacy and decision-making literacy that I um, lay out in the book and that I think we should be teaching uh, beginning at, you know, to eight-year-olds, I mean, some of the more nuanced things, maybe not till high school. Uh, and it involves things that uh, some of you engineers know, Bayesian inferencing, updating your estimates of uh, probabilities with new information. Uh, but I think this is very important. Uh, and I think that uh, getting back to uh, the idea of what we should teach our children, just to, not to put too fine a point on it, but... Um, they're going to encounter the facts on their own. They, they already know how to find out information. What they're not getting trained in adequately, I think, is uh, how to evaluate those sources of in information and how to use them creatively and intelligently. And I think solving the biggest problems in the world will require a combination of that, you know, knowing how to use information, and having adequate opportunities to let the daydreaming or creative mode kick in I mean, let's face it, the biggest problems we're looking at in the world right now, aggression uh, across borders and within countries, um, poverty, unequal distribution of wealth, climate change, if the, problems, if, if the problems had simple linear solutions, somebody would have figured them out already. Uh, it's more likely that they'll come from people who are thinking outside the box, as we say, thinking creatively. And for that to happen, it's not going to happen while you're doing 10 things at once and giving five seconds of attention to each one. It's going to happen when you have a sustained period to deal with them. Now, when I talk about being organized, I, I don't want there to be a misunderstanding. I'm not talking about all of us being like Mr. Spock and being completely regimented and unemotional uh, and logical all the time. What I'm talking about is being able to uh, bring more efficiency uh, to the workday, so that at the end of the day, you can close the door on it and have more time for spontaneity, for creativity, uh, for time with loved ones, and for fun. I'm talking about being able to introduce those elements more regularly in your life because you're not feeling like you're always behind, that uh, you're able to make the most out of every minute and every opportunity. So that's all I had to say, and I'd be happy to take questions. And above all, I'm grateful to all of you for spending this afternoon with me. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah. Um, one of the things you touched on is the, the rapidity with which you can make decisions and how quickly you can do your thing, your work, and so on. And, and yet, one of the things that Google does is it tries to minimize the amount of time it takes to get a response. You type a query, and it's 300 milliseconds or whatever. Right? 
And so we encourage a very rapid iteration, a very rapid uh, query response cycle. And yet there's evidence to suggest that sometimes slowing the pace of work down increases accuracy, increases depth of processing, and so on. How do you make these sort of personal evaluations in your life and in your decision-making process? Um, I try to um, I try to figure out whether uh, I try to prioritize uh, my decision making and, and f separate the big ones from the little ones, and deal with the big ones in the morning when my gumption is at a, a high. Uh, and then I, I follow the advice of David Allen and other efficiency experts. Um, try to figure out what do I need in order to make this decision in order to push this forward, especially if one's been lingering for a while. Do I need more information? If so, where am I going to get that? Can I delegate the acquisition of that information to someone else? Is there an expert I can ask? Uh, do I need time to just think it over? This is what judges do, of course. They, they often get all the information and then allow themselves a couple of days to ruminate about it, especially when there are big consequences. Um, you, you raised another point about the rapidity of information and, you know, uh, Google has made searches in order of magnitude more efficient than they used to be, uh, and you know most of the time, uh, you know, and especially Google Scholar for somebody in my line of work is very helpful. Most of the time, you get exactly what you're looking for, and if not, it's it's not too far off. But I was thinking the other day um, about how you know I, I wrote a lot of this book in libraries. Uh, and I would be walking to a shelf to get a book and something else would catch my eye. And I would start looking at it and it was something that was fascinating and wonderful that I didn't even know I was interested in. And that would set me off on some nonlinear but wonderful path. And I was thinking, uh, what I'd like to see in Google, I'm, I'm sure everybody comes here and tells you stuff that you've already thought of. Uh, I'd like to see a serendipity button where um, when I get my search results, uh, that are very accurate and focused, uh, there's a separate column of the near misses. Things that aren't exactly the right one, but that are sort of related, the kinds of things I might have found if I was walking along in a bookstore or library that, you know, on the shelf next to it. Uh, I would find that um, a nice feature. Of course, I can use somebody else's search engine and get those automatically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unintentionally, automatically, just to. <laughs> Your tips were really helpful. I was wondering if there's uh, anything somebody with a attention deficit disorder can do to improve and organize their lives better. So attention deficit disorder is an interesting um, phenomenon. Uh, it, it really does exist. Um, many people with attention deficit disorder uh, are able to be especially creative because of the way their mind works going from one unrelated thought to another. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, is that uh, people with ADD tend to start a lot of projects and not finish any of them. So uh, I think the greatest thing is when somebody with ADD is paired with somebody in the workplace uh, who may not have a desire to be particularly creative and is a real kind of focused, logical, get things done person. And that person can, you know, working together as a team, they can really accomplish great things. In fact, some companies do this implicitly without using labels like ADD or um, uh, task manager or project manager. But, you know, this sort of companies sort of, big companies sort of sort themselves out in this way, especially when you're putting together project teams. You know, you're thinking implicitly, well, this person has a lot of great ideas. Uh, this person gets things done. And you know we're not using the clinical labels, but it's the same kind of idea. Of course, then there are drugs. Uh, Ritalin, or otherwise known as methylphenidate, can help ADD people to stay focused. But many report that they feel a loss of creativity. So they finally get things done, but they they don't feel that they're they're doing their best work. So you mentioned multitasking is uh, bad um, and uh, essentially not uh, an illusion, right? Um, and you gave references to about, you know, switching every five minutes or so. Is there data or do you have a sense of what is the amount of time at least that someone should focus on a task to and then switch? I think it depends on the task. So there are some things that you know will only take a minute or two. 
And if you're trying to create a productive day, it's best to group those all and do them all in like a, a, an hour where you can do all the little things. It might be going through your email, emails and sorting them, or you might have to log into a website to find out how much you owe the water company uh, and then pay your bill. I mean, all these little things, you know, that, that only takes two minutes. And, you know, productivity experts say if there's something that takes two minutes, do it right now or not in the middle of something else, but, you know, do it today. Um, other tasks that are going to require weeks or months of work, um, you know, things with a long event horizon, I think you really want to be able to put in a, a, at least an hour at a time on the task and maybe carve out three or four or five hours throughout the day where you're just doing that, maybe up to an hour and a half or two. There are big individual differences uh, among the thousands of ways that human beings differ from one another, big differences in, in how long people can sustain attention. And as you know, it changes throughout the week and throughout the seasons. But um, I think that for anything we care about, uh, you're looking at closer to an hour than five minutes. Uh, although every once in a while you surprise yourself. Some great songs were written in 15 minutes. What about um, research into uh, different sorts of activities that you can maybe more successfully do at the same time than others? Like, for example, uh, I remember at a company I used to work on, we did most of our communication by conference call. And so if somebody was like typing or looking at the email, you could definitely tell on the conference call because you know, they simply just seem to not be able to do both things at the same time. If you ask them to speak, there'd be a big pause compared to the people that were really concentrating. But uh, you know, I remember also that I often used to be at home and doing something else at the same time, completely different, like um, the washing up or something, and seem to be able to do that much more successfully at the same time. Uh, there's another guy who would run during our conference calls. <laughs> so um, what research is there on the type of activity that people try and do at the same time? Well, so I think it's, it's worth thinking about what, um, I think we all have a good intuition about this, what parts of your brain you're using. If you're using the verbal parts to talk on the phone and do email and text at the same time, you're not, you're not really doing them all at once. On the other hand, if you're standing on a treadmill and reading, that's okay because you're using, using you know, different parts of your brain for keeping the exercise going than you are for reading the article. Uh, there's an interesting case with driving. Um, driving actually benefits from multitasking in a very limited way. Uh, if you're on a long drive and you know and you've been driving for a while, you're a, a competent, experienced driver, uh, and, and there are no hazards in the road and, and it's not a windy road, it's a straight piece of freeway like Highway 5 here, um, you're going to get bored and your attention is going to uh, sag and that's dangerous. So listening to music while you're driving, if it's the right kind of music, not, you know, lullabies, but the right kind of music that will raise your physiological arousal level just a bit will actually make you a better driver because it's functioning as a stimulant. Uh, if the music is too engrossing, if it's trance music, uh, that's pulling you too far out of the driving, so you've got to hit the happy balance. This is actually kind of a follow-on to the previous question, but how would you classify sort of learning activities in the sense that it seems that when you're learning, especially when you're learning a physical task, like there are aspects of it that you do automatically and then you have to focus a lot of attention on, on the bit that you're not familiar with. That's a great question. So um, I know the most about learning musical instruments and musical passages, uh, but it applies to a number of other things, to athletics and to acting and to other uh, uh, motor learning kinds of things. You're asking about motor learning in particular. So um, it turns out that just doing the motor movements isn't very efficient or very helpful. You have to be uh, conscious and focused on what you're doing and why you're doing it. So musicians uh, talk about deliberate practice. Uh, piano teachers talk about uh, when you're on the bus uh, be mentally practicing the piano in your head and picturing where your fingers go and that when you sit down uh, you can't just let your fingers go there you have to be thinking about what they're doing and how they relate to the music in your head or the music on the page uh, and and really it's a mental exercise as much as a physical one uh, for for the practice time to be efficient uh, and not to just practice by rote but to practice you know mindfully but I, I guess what I was trying to ask about is how does that 
uh, sort of tie into the notion that multitasking is an illusion? Well, here, um, I, I don't see it as multitasking. If you're doing it right, uh, they're completely integrated, right? So the idea of thinking about what you're doing and doing it and then getting some feedback about whether you actually did what you thought you were going to do and then maybe changing it so that, you know, to make some modifications, that's all part and parcel of... Uh, when, when I'm talking about unitasking, I don't mean you can only have one tiny little kernel of thought in your mind. I mean that you're focused on a constellation of ideas that surround a single activity. Um, so you mentioned before that a 15-minute nap can make up for an hour of sleep. And I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more how that's physically possible. And if so, why aren't we all just taking two hours of naps every night? Uh, well, if you sleep longer than 15 minutes, uh, you enter, well, longer than about 25 or 30, you enter into deeper sleep, and it's harder to wake up from that. And so long naps in the middle of the day are not uh, helpful. It's really the short naps that are. What's happening is, um, at nighttime, is memory consolidation. And we have only a relatively recent understanding of this role for nighttime sleep. And that is that uh, during your regular six or eight or ten hour stretch of sleep at night, uh, your neurons are going over the experiences and thoughts and activities of the day and processing them in a way that allows them to get into your long-term memory, turning them over, thinking of links between them, uh, connections, uh, and storing them. If your sleep is disrupted at night, uh, you know, because you stayed up too late or you woke up too many times or, you know, something like that, it can um, disturb the memories for the previous day for up to weeks or months afterwards. Now, if you're working in an intellectually demanding job uh, and you're putting in four or five hours of work uh, in the morning, say from eight to one in the afternoon, when one rolls around, um, you know, your brain's been working pretty hard and you've taken in a lot of information and so being able to enter just the first stages of sleep uh, has the effect of hitting a neurophysiological reset button. It relaxes some circuits. You make a few little connections. You're pre-processing stuff for that night's uh, sleep episode. And there's a neurochemical story that uh, I can point you to in an article, a series of articles by Matthew Walker at UC Berkeley. I have a fun question about vacation, if we can go back to that and start planning my next one. Um, how much, well, I have a couple of questions about your recommendations. Like, how much time do you think is required to take off in order to re-energize for getting back into, like, a heavy episode of work, like, weeks on end? Um, what type of vacation do you think is recommended? Um, you mentioned like taking walks around nature and having that be like a good charge. Does that have any impact in like longer term stints somewhere? So just kind of like scaling, scaling the small naps and walks like out to days and weeks, like what's recommended? I haven't, there, I don't know of any literature that recommends a particular amount of time or a particular kind of vacation. <laughs> I'll write it. <laughs> uh, there may be a vacation doctor out there. Uh, I, think, I think it's probably, uh, the case that nobody's studied this, but if they did, my, my guess is that they'd find there are huge individual differences from person to person and from time to time in your life. There, I'm sure you've all had the experience where uh, you just felt like you needed um, a day off and other times where you felt like you just needed two weeks or a month off and it has to do with a lot of factors about what's going on in your life and in your brain and in your body and your health and nutrition and stress and you know, stressful episodes can take a very long time to get over. Grief can take months. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's just, you know, regular workday stuff that you're trying to get away from, a shorter vacation would suffice. And if it's the loss of a loved one, it could take months. Uh, of, I mean, not a vacation, but months of recovery. Actually, I'm a, a technical writer here at uh, Google, and I've also been a former librarian. And uh, reading your book, it's interesting. A lot of us spend a lot of time on the web. And to pick out the design elements that appeal to the distracted mind and a lot that appeal to the focused mind. Uh, can you comment on that? Because you spend a lot of time on the, on the web. These are really interesting design questions. Um, 
you know, the very first search engines were very cluttered and uh, headache-inducing, and Google is well known for having introduced this spare homepage. Uh, and I think implicit in your question is that a lot of people like that sparsity, but not everybody does, and it doesn't meet the needs of all different kinds of processing styles. And um, I, I imagine that there's a literature on this in the computer and human interaction design community, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, I know that um, for people who are easily distracted, people with attention deficit problems, um, having that big white space is very intimidating and um, not very helpful, but then having too much going on would be distracting. There's got to be some uh, balance there. Uh, one of the tips I give in the book for people who have attention deficit disorder in terms of filing things, and maybe this is applicable, uh, there's some research that shows that if they can file by color, uh, instead of by words, right? So the problem with a lot of people who are easily distracted or have attention deficit is that they can't focus on the words that are written on the um, tab of a physical uh, file folder or the names of files on the computer. Uh, and so color coding can help. Everything related to a certain project is red. Everything related to another project is green. And then spatially organizing them so everything related to the Penske file is over here and everything related to the um, Miller file is over here, uh, either on the desktop of the computer or on the physical desktop. You know, I remember some years ago, Apple, as part of their OS, had introduced this way of having custom icons for the folders. The folder didn't have to look like a folder. It could look like anything. It could be a Simpsons character. It could be any, any JPEG or TIFF. And, um, some people that I know that had these kinds of difficulties and challenges found that very helpful because it allowed them to sort things visually and not have to rely on words. You mentioned uh, the positive value of reading with respect to recharge and creativity and being an avid and permanently addicted reader. I'm always looking for some positive value proposition I can sell to my kids that <laughs> an hour of literary fiction is more beneficial than an hour of YouTube. And I found it challenging. And I wondered if you had any uh, words of wisdom in that area. I think it comes down to what the role of art in society is, how we consider the role of art in society. So art in general, uh, and literature in particular, helps us to recontextualize the world, to see things from another perspective, to see things uh, from a particular person's perspective, maybe somebody from a different background, a different age, a different uh, set of world views. Uh, we, we learn to empathize uh, with other viewpoints and other people. Uh, and we learn to see in this recontextualization process connections between things where we didn't see those connections before. And uh, this, this can stimulate all kinds of neural processes where we're momentarily comparing our lives to the lives we're reading about. We identify with some of the characters and we imagine what we would do in these situations. And this is um, a tremendously important experience for boosting creativity and empathy and uh, understanding of, of the world. Uh, and I do think that the role of art is to do those things. Uh, I don't think the, the purpose of art is to make us better at math. Uh, or to simply be um, a way to fill time between work hours and sleep. I think art is supposed to challenge us uh, to think differently, and great literature can do that. And I mean that about uh, literary fiction as well as literary nonfiction and poetry. Um, and that very act of having your mind wander while you're reading is part of the treasure of it. And uh, I think it needs to be encouraged. Now, of course, you know, watching Watching TV is different, or YouTube videos, or you know, watching moving images is different because you can't really control the pace like you can when you're reading. Uh, and I, mean, yeah, I guess you can hit the pause button, but you know, people don't. Uh, in reading, though, you, you can take your time and you can go back over it uh, very easily. And I, I, I think it's, it's important to encourage ch children to do that.
And again, I think, I think some of the world's biggest problems are more apt to be solved by people who have taken inspiration from the arts. Um, so kind of a follow-up on the video part of it. What I've noticed is that we tend to classify videos as very much like, okay, these are cat videos or these are distracting and so on and so forth. But they're, at least in my mind, I mean, when I compare my own experience, say, you know, an hour and a half reading some literary fiction versus reading Twitter, right? I mean, there's a world of difference. But interestingly, I notice there's the same difference if I watch a two and a half hour documentary on something like something that Ken Burns made, for example, versus something on YouTube. So is there any data or do you have any comment on, you know, the quality of video that you can watch as opposed to? Well, I, I would put Ken Burns uh, in the category of literary nonfiction, right? His documentaries employ artistic techniques, narrative techniques, narrative momentum, character development. Uh, and so uh, I think they're functioning in a more artistic capacity. Uh, uh, just because they're nonfiction doesn't mean that they're not artistic, of course. So my question is um, about napping at, in the day and at work. So I, I don't, uh, I've never tried this. And uh, the only time I remember napping was, you know, after having kids when it just, <laughs> the tiredness just makes you nap. So I'm wondering about how do you get into this? And I'm also wondering about the, the comment you made about like you have to make sure not to go into too deep a sleep. So are you meant to set an alarm? How does all that work? So uh, it, some people can more easily take naps than others. Some people fall asleep very quickly, some people don't, and there are individual differences here. Uh, if, if you're the kind of person that takes 15 to 30 minutes to fall asleep at night, it's less likely that you'll be able to f carve time out of your day at work. It's not just like you can slip into the nap room and come out 15 minutes later. And so knowing that about yourself is important, and maybe instead of taking naps, you'll engage in other uh, restorative brain activities. It might be listening to music or reading a novel or um, taking a walk around the building, uh, looking at, at p art pictures or something uh, of, of fine art. Uh, so to some extent, you're, you're stuck with your neurogenetic makeup uh, in terms of whether you're somebody who falls asleep quickly. Um, if you do fall asleep quickly and you, yeah, I mean, a lot of people do set alarms after 15 minutes so that they don't enter that deeper sleep. Um, now, I, I know there are exceptions. There, when you're talking about human physiology, there are a lot of exceptions. I know somebody who takes two-hour naps every day, gets a full eight hours sleep at night, takes two-hour naps in the afternoon, and that works for her. Uh, but on average, it, it doesn't work for the, for the, for the rest of us uh, because it's it's putting you in too deep a sleep mode and you wake up with a mental fog. Uh, and if you, you know, the body also uh, has these internal clocks that expect the same thing at every time of, of the day. So um, if you can arrange your life this way that you can try to take a nap at the same time every day and eat your meals at the same time every day because they work into the cycle and exercise at the same time, you might find with a little practice after a week or two that your naps are coming more easily because your body's conditioned for it. Thank you, thank you very much. Great, thanks. <laughs>